everyday witches emerge from the shadows of secrecy. Broom closets are flinging open and witches are taking flight. Whether you are hiding in your cozy closet or flying with pride, stay for a spell as witch casting with Theodora Pendragon and her guests share magical moments, stir the cauldron and debunk misinformation and misconceptions about paganism, witches and our wonderful world of magic. Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I have another special guest. Of course, they're all special guests. And today we have Cole, and she is an eclectic spiritualist and a witch. Welcome, Cole. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So today, let's talk about closets. There are different kinds of closets. Broom closets, rainbow closets. Mm -hmm. I remember when I met you a few years ago, you were doing a ritual. I believe it was a Yule ritual. And I remember you made an announcement at the beginning of the ritual, before it started, and you said, please don't take any photographs of anyone without their permission, because not everyone's out of the broom closet. Yes, I did say that. Part of my um, general paragraphs that I would read and make sure that I would say at every ritual, and that's definitely one of them. It's kind of like a disclosure statement before everything goes on. And the reason is because... Like you said, I said, not everybody's out of the broom closet. And I get various reasons for that, uh, be it family, friends, and or workplace environments. It's actually kind of an issue I'm dealing with right now. My wife actually has never come out of either broom or rainbow closet at work. The only person who actually knows that she's with a woman is her boss. And she only let her know that when we got married in 2017. We'd actually been together for seven years prior to, but even though she works for a company that promotes and says that they're inclusive and everything, that doesn't, and they have laws or rules in their HR department or whatever, that states discrimination is not adhered to. It doesn't mean that there isn't workplace judgment or things that might start to happen that you can't prove it's because of whatever discrimination it is that they're judging you or making sure you don't hear this meeting or making sure you don't get this information because underlying issues is they don't like you because you're gay or because you're pagan or whatever the reason may be. And so because of that, and for so long, she had kept it a secret from work. Even before meeting me, we decided to continue to be that way. Sometimes it does kind of hurt me that you know, she doesn't get to talk about her spouse like everybody else gets to talk about their spouses at work. I support her and trust her decisions where that is concerned. For her, I'm sure it hurts too that she can't be completely, totally you know, open and honest because she says this a lot. She goes, technically, I'm a Gen Xer and we just don't talk about our personal stuff. You know, we um, probably elder X, gener X, generation X. She's like, we just don't talk about that stuff. We don't stand on our soapbox and stuff, you know, and so it's none of their business. And then, but now um, there's some concerns, you know, with the politics and everything that's going on. It's kind of scary, you know, out there politically. I'm really glad that the Marriage Act passed so that we feel a little bit safer on a federal level. It's still kind of scary that way. But then also things are happening at work where she really believes her um, subordinates are starting to realize, even though they can't say, hey, we looked you up and we know that you're married because that's illegal and they could get in trouble and lose their job. But we have a feeling that they've already done that and they're trying to get her to come out of the closet and she, she's scared and I don't blame her. She's had harder coming out of the closets than I have. I mean, yes, I faced my own discrimination in family and workplace, but I am so lucky to have had the grandmother that I had. 
coming out of the broom and rainbow closet, uh, she was very supportive. Um, my dad, even though he's an extreme religious fanatic, he still was also very supportive, even though um, there's still this background of, um, you're not going to go to heaven, but I still love you. And I wish you'd go to heaven with me, but I got to let you be yourself, kind of. So it's a little weird with my dad, but um, I at least didn't have, I, I wasn't thrown out of my house. I wasn't, you know, cut off from all family because of whatever. Um, when I hear those stories, it's so sad. I Because if gra my grandmother ever did that to me, it, it would have been pretty devastating for me. Your parents weren't witches? No. Um, my dad, my grandmother used to say this, that guy changes religion like he changes underwear. He literally started out as, he actually was supposed, because he was the middle child, according to tradition in most Catholic Hispanic families, the middle child was supposed to go to the priesthood to become a priest. My dad was actually in uh, Catholic schools and was en route to, to be what his parents told him that he should be until he became a teenager and his hormones went crazy and he realized he liked having sex. And so he decided not to become a priest. You know, that's interesting. I've known many families, Catholic families, where the children are told, you are going to be a nun and you are going to be a priest. I believe that should be one's own calling. Oh, yeah, definitely. So he went from being Catholic to I'm not doing anything religion. I'm kind of Catholic to changing every every woman that he was with. He was a different faith. He did get out of the Catholic faith and never went back just before I was born or just before he got with my mother. Um, I'm not sure what he was doing prior to, but um, he decided to be a Baptist to Southern Baptist to evangelical Christian, to non-denominational Christian, to dabbling with, what was the other? I mean, there was something in between that and what he is now, which is Jehovah Witness. With each new girlfriend, he had a different religion. So I think it kind of just, whatever she was believing, and as long as it was some streamline of Christian, then he was okay with it. So whenever he got a new girlfriend, he'd become that religion. He was a chameleon. Yeah, pretty much. But as long as it had like a Christian underlining, anything else was a no-go. But even despite all those faiths and religions or me in high school, you know, backing away from religion, okay, fine, I'll attend church every now and then, but this isn't my thing. I would say I'm Christian for people would ask me, but because that's all I knew. I knew something was wrong and I was different. Going to those classes, Christian classes or whatever, whatever church my dad happened to be going to at the time. Like, I remember asking, that doesn't seem fair, in a story about the woman. I know the stories, but I don't remember where in the Bible, but somewhere in the Old Testament, um, a woman was a concubine, left her husband to run back to her dad. He went to get her, went through all kinds of trials and tribulations to get her back from the father. They stop at a, on their way back home at a village that was corrupt. And the village wanted the man to come out, uh, many different interpretations for that, but instead he threw his concubine and they raped her, beat her, and she was dead on the doorstep the next day. So what did he do? He cut her up into a certain number of pieces for the tribes and sent them as a warning about this place. And it's like, how is that a lesson for me spiritually, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say that as a kid. I remember being like, I don't know, 13 and saying, that doesn't seem right. How could you treat her like that and say you love her or what go through all those trials and tribulations to get her back just to do that to her? You know, that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem Christian at all, you know, and then they would try to say things to quiet me in that she deserved what she got. So I remember just constantly thinking the contradictions, especially against women. I didn't want to be this way. And then finally, 14, 15, I'm like, Dad, I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't like that church. When I finally became an adult and had my own money and job, and I literally moved out of my house at the age of 17. And I started going to churches, different ones, because I was trying to find something 
to feed that spiritual part of myself, but I was not finding it. I didn't find it until I, until I took a Bible as literature class in college and my world religion class in college. And by doing that, it like opened up so much and then reminded me of the people in high school that I were friends with that told me they were Wiccan. And it kind of just branched from there. And I was started to do my searching and, and then moving to Texas and finding like-minded people that eventually led me to paganism. You just found the right people. Right. So it's just like, it kind of just people like have an interesting reaction when I tell them that it started with my Bible as literature class, where we read the Bible as a piece of literature for the times in which it was written, as opposed to religious doctrine. And it was taught by a woman who heard doctorate was in ancient Hebrew and Greek languages. And so she was able to, it was from her that I learned that the word pedophile was switched to homosexual to to um, move forward a Catholic agenda to get rid of the homosexuals in the area, you know? And so there's so much misinterpretations of that. I mean, same thing with um, thou shall not suffer a witch to live is constantly thrown our way. <laughs> Um, but witch is another one of those words. It wasn't witch. It was poisoner. Yeah, it was, it was someone who dabbled in poisons, uh, to to help people kill people. (laughs) Um, do you know who changed the word? I don't. It's King James. Yeah. King James was so afraid of witches that he changed that in the Bible from poisoner to witches. Yeah. But a lot of people are afraid of witches. Yeah. Why do you think they're afraid of witches? I think it's very interesting that we're constantly, as a human race, constantly fearing that which we don't understand. I mean, we see that in alien movies, in novels, in our history, you know, anything strange and different from the norm. Pagan, the the outsider of what is norm is always seen to be cautious. But we also we understand that anatomy-wise, because even as kids, things are brightly colored or whatever, or things that hiss or are different, we have to have caution. But that doesn't mean we should fear it or hate it or snuff it out just because of that. And as sentient, higher-thinking beings, I just wish we would recognize that delicate balance there as opposed to, oh, kill it. No, 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 let's understand it first safely. <laughs> With curiosity, you know, I mean, even we teach that in corporate culture and in counseling and things like that, always have curious questions. Don't just come right at it with, I don't know, this negative, overwhelming sense of judgment first. Humans continue to fear that which we don't understand and they they don't seem to understand witches. Plus, with the patriarchy right behind it, wanting to snuff out the power of women because we are pretty powerful. Women can do amazing things and we don't need men and, and our society and the patriarchy has done a lot of damage, not just to women, but to men as well, you know, because like, well, if I'm not this box that the patriarchy has put me in as a man, then they're right. The women don't need me. Then where do I fit in? It hurts all genders, not just male, female, they, thems. I mean, this whole thing is just so much more complex. And I'm only touching on very tiny threads of this big giant knot that we have found ourselves in as a human race, Um, which is just part of it. I want to reclaim witches and the term pagan as something more positive. But I also like using synonyms to help explain that to people who are at least willing to say, well, I don't understand you, and I do fear witches. Well, let me help you a little bit to kind of understand that concept. How do you explain that? Well, I first tell people I'm kind of literal. So let's start with uh, the definition. So um, we bring out Webster's Dictionary, and we look up pagan, and the definition is any faith or any religion that is outside of the main world religions. And then if you go to, say, like uh, pewresearch.com, which does a lot of statistics and um, research for different religions in in the world and in the nation, the world over still has the majority in Abrahamic faiths. 
So that would be Muslim, Christian, Jewish, anything that came from the God of Abraham. So they still technically hold the majority. So by literal definition, pagan is just saying everything else. Umbrella term. And when they think about that in a literal sense, they're like, oh, well, then Buddhism is under there. Even though Buddhists don't really want to be called pagan, but they do still have deities. And we're still needing to allow, because pagan is a Latin term, we shouldn't tell the Voodoo's that they should be considered pagan because they're all outside the world, the, the Abrahamic faiths. You know, we are a society of differences and we should not put colonial terms on people that definitely should be allowed to not be termed pagan. So I try to start with that literal definition just to get them thinking about it. And when I tell them, especially for me, my witchcraft and science is like combined. I'm kind of a, a nerd. I love quantum physics and mechanics. Um, so a lot of stuff that I do, whether it be burning a candle uh, for candle magic, or um, a spell or cleansing, if I had like some science or understanding behind it, it helps me and makes my magic feel stronger. And I do see more results because I'm able to have this scientific connection with my, my witchcraft. So I explain some of quantum mechanics and physics, my simple uh, understandings of it with my witchcraft, when I'm explaining paganism to others, and I people tend to be less like, oh, okay. So like, I almost didn't have a good connection with my niece's mom. But when I explained all of that to her and let her know what I believed and that not every pagan is the same, so, but this is at least me, then she was more, oh, okay, well then it's not so bad and I don't mind my daughter hanging out with you. And if she has questions that you're going to, I just have these little things that I want you to keep in mind. Cause I'm still raising my daughter as a Christian and that's my right. Cause I'm her mom. And I'm like, okay. And I respect that. And we kind of go from there, but at least I'm still able to connect and communicate with my niece. So did she think that being a witch was a bad thing until so you clarified it? Yes, she really thought uh, that witches were were evil, that we purposely killed things to set about spells or hex people constantly that were, you know, very much the negative connotation in pop culture where witches are concerned because not only her, but I have had one other person reference um, True Blood. And the evil witches that were in, like, the first or second season of True Blood, you know, before other seasons came along. And I saw a better Hollywood trying to be a little bit better and nicer to witches. <laughs> I had to laugh. I said, you know what? You don't have to be a witch to have orgies. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you, don't have, <laughs> you don't have to be a pagan to be malicious and hurt animals in a, in a negative connotation. So... Um, it's not just a pagan thing. It's the same thing with anything negative. You can find deviance in every circle, be it spiritual, uh, recreational, or professional. It's, deviants are going to be there. Hopefully you can trust the person enough, like me and my morals and ethics and beliefs, that I'm not going to be doing those types of things. Yeah, no, I, I won't kill anybody unless they're trying to kill me first. <laughs> Yeah, there are good and bad people in every group. It doesn't matter if they're witches or if it's a car club or a dog club or... Right. Yeah. And predators will go to the areas that'll make it easiest for their targets. It doesn't matter. And targets can be found anywhere and deviants and predators can be found anywhere. And going back to what you said a few minutes ago about the majority and the minority, I can give the example of... When I was a child, I'm a redhead, and I was one of the very few redheads in any of my schools, and I went to a lot of different schools being a military kid, but I was the kid where they teased me, red on the head, peed the bed. So I had to live with that all those years just because I was a redhead. <laughs> I mean, isn't that crazy? It is crazy. 
They will find um, kids can be mean, you know, and any groups can be mean. They find that little nuance or that thing that it makes you just a little bit different than everybody else. And like, do we have to have an outsider? I mean, who cares? You know, I, I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I'm not. And the word that you chose just now, a little bit different. Isn't it nice to be different? I don't want to be like everybody else. No. I can find differences in every single person that I meet. And that's the commonality for me. We're all different. And I want us to all be different. Because it doesn't work if we're all the same. It's, it's boring. We, we, just, we never get outside of the box. The wheel will keep turning and going, but it's not going to go. It's going to go in the same direction forever. And what happens when things stay the same? Stagnicity. That's not life. We're supposed to grow and change and, and flourish. Biologically, thinkingly, uh, spiritually, we should continue to fail forward. Was it? Yeah, it was Maya Angelou, you know, once you know better, do better. You know, if so once you know something, well, crap, I've been doing it wrong this whole time, or I've been messing up and being an asshole this whole time. Well, you know what? Now that I know, let's move forward. Spiritually, I do that as a witch. I, I try to do that in my life every day, and it's hard. Your pagan path opened up so many doors for you. You are the founder of Eclectic Traditions. Yes. Tell us about Eclectic Traditions. I came to Texas. I found all these groups, and I felt like I found home. I was like, oh, my goodness. My spirit is so happy. I went to so many different groups. I mean, I would hunt on the internet, look at holistic festivals, and um, we had Unlimited Thought Bookstore for a time. It's no longer around, which is sad, but they would have flyers, and people always knew that was the only place at least you could find events. And I would take everything that I could possibly get, and I would just go to every single group, meetup, festival that I could find because I was in a fever rush. Got me into... Some interesting places. <laughs> what does that mean? Huh. It means I got myself into certain places where it probably wasn't safe to be a single woman alone because predators are everywhere and pagans and hippies tend to be a little bit more free love and everything. So um, you have to be more careful in those circles, especially if they don't have um, good intentions. They don't have good intentions or, or background. They're just using it as a, as a means to find victims. And I have found myself in certain circles where things were getting not very comfortable for me as a single woman. And I literally, it was at night around a bonfire, some of these, and I would literally learn how to fade into the background. I learned how to be invisible <laughs> and kind of just leave, go get to my car and leave and leave and get the hell out of those places. And when I started going to others that were better and there were children involved and people were like, oh, I just wish I could bring my husbands, but it's only for women to be in circle. Or I wish I could bring my children because I can't always get out and be in circle with people because I've got kids and they can't come to the ritual. I'm like, well, why don't we have a place for pagans where they can bring their families, their husbands, their kids, and it be a family friendly environment and that's how eclectic traditions was born my wife now would go with me and we decided to create this group and it was amazing um up until the pandemic uh we had a huge following and because i'm such a i'm a person who wants to give as much information as possible especially to those new on their path I don't want them to end up in those search in those situations that I ended up in and was able to be safe and get out of because not everybody is. I make sure I gave them the cult e evaluation frame, which is and anybody can find it online. If you look up cult evaluation frame, if you Google that, you'll be able to find some resources that will help you identify what a cult is. I would teach people. What are your personal morals, ethics, and beliefs? And then once you figure out what those are within, then you'll be able to find your spiritual group without. Which is why, okay, if you want to be a Christian, awesome. And you want to be an open-minded Christian, okay. But in my literal interpretation of your doctrine, 
there's no room for me. Why would I believe that? That's just an example. But it's the same thing if someone was looking for a druidic faith. But if it doesn't fit with your morals, ethics, and beliefs, their literal doctrine, if you go to a group and they tell you, hey, this is this is our creed or covenant, and this is what we believe in, and there's some lines in there that you don't agree with, well, then that's not your group. And so you have to look at it from a within, per, you have to know who you are within first, really, before you can go find that spiritual group without. I am really happy that Eclectic Traditions was such an amazing journey for me. It's still going on. It's just online now. It's still very eclectic. We get different leaders, different rituals, different belief systems, and we create rituals for the eight Sabbaths. And then we post a video on YouTube. Right now for the year of 2023, there are reruns because I'm taking a year break. I'm trying to find a job and I'm doing extra stuff at the UU Church in New Braunfels where we have a cups chapter. So a lot of my stuff is going towards there to get them set. And then in 2024, I'll start doing videos again. I'm even thinking about doing maybe one or two live open circle rituals again, just to start a little bit. That would be nice. Yeah. I understand the reasons why your wife is in her two closets. Are you also in your two closets? No. And that's what makes it kind of hard between my wife and I is because she is so much in her closet. She is closeted in both and I am way out and not as loud and proud as I used to be because she's kind of toned me down a little bit because I have to kind of meet her halfway and not be so "Ah!" and shout it. (laughs) Because when I first met her, I didn't, I had no filter or no my social cues and my social agenda was all about over explain, over detail, give you as much information as possible, even if it's TMI. Was it because you were excited or you just wanted to educate people? What was the reason you were giving too much information? I think it was just I was excited to be able to be myself. And even in new workplaces, I refused to to have to hide it. Just People in random conversations, it, it, let's just say, whether we're talking about spirituality or work, I should be able to say, no, I'm not Christian. No. Oh, you mean my wife, not my husband? Yes. <laughs> but I, I never really get like any major shock to anything if I choose to say that now. But I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to find out if these people like me or not. And if it's no big deal, then awesome. You know, I'm going to keep doing it, you know, because... I want it to be normalized. You know, I want it to be no big deal. Reminds me of this comic that I saw. It's a lesbian couple walking down the street, and they got three different reactions. One, and they're holding hands. One, they got the mom, no, don't look, don't look, don't look, at their kid, you know, making sure they don't see two women holding hands romantically walking down the street. And then... A second reaction was someone coming up and shaking their hand saying, I am so proud of you. You keep being yourself and you do it and you keep going. And like, like continues with different reactions. And by the end, the couple's just like, can we just hold hands and walk down the street and not have any issue, be it whatever? Because I mean, one of them, oh, well, they're just encouraging them to be themselves. Well, no, it's I should be able to walk down the street holding my hand, holding my my friend, my lover's hand, whoever's hand I'm holding, without any reaction. It should just be normal. I should be able to just do that and be myself. And so I think that was maybe my reasoning for constantly being that way. So I have toned it down a little bit, um, but definitely not when I'm by myself. When I'm by myself and I'm at work or meeting new people especially since I've been looking for jobs this year, I'm pretty open about it. I'm like, um, I just met actually my neighbors because we're having to fix our fence. And I didn't come out where I say, hey, I'm pagan. But I was wearing a shirt that said Mercury's got nothing on me because currently Mercury is in retrograde. (laughs) Based on my shirt and just certain things, I think they realize I'm a little different, but your little woo? Yeah, a little woo-woo. But it definitely got her, the wife, feeling comfortable enough to tell me, oh, well, I don't believe in that any of that. Or um, or those Mormons that came and I just told them to keep leaving. Or she made comments that were like, 
Like, I'm, like she could be like any moment she could say she's agnostic or atheist, like any moment. <laughs> but she didn't because we were both kind of filling each other out. It was it was an interesting experience. We'll see what happens next time. I remember when I first met you, it was at Pagan Pride Day quite a few years back. I can't remember what year that was. And you had these pins and you were handing them out and it said, ask me about my pagan. And I thought, man, this woman's so cool. Well, thank you. I really want to be able to do that again. But since 2020, it's been really hard for the pagan pride days. But I make buttons that say, ask me about my pagan. And all of the buttons have different spiritual images on them. Animals, geometric patterns, nature, pentacles. I mean, whatever I could find that will make every button different and unique. It actually used to be a workshop before uh, Pagan Pride Day. I would get anybody who wanted to get together and help me make these buttons. And I would fill my cloak with all of these buttons. And you would get a button if you are willing to talk about what makes you pagan. And the reason why each of them says, ask me about my pagan is because only I, only that person can talk about their pagan because every single pagan is going to be different because we start with what our individual within morals, ethics, and beliefs are, and then interpret our spirituality outside of that and figure out where we kind of find our like minds and our niches within the pagan umbrella. And so at Pagan Pride Day, especially since we were at the mall, at some of these times that I was doing that when we were having our festival, I wanted to make sure that people knew just because that person over there has dark fey kind of pagan tendencies doesn't mean that I'm going to be the same way or that person over there. And I would joke and I would get people talking about it. Uh, Some of my favorite things to get people laughing, it's like, I'm like, I can't talk about his pagan or their pagan or her pagan because I don't know where their pagans have been, but I know where mine's been. (laughs) So get people laughing and talking about it. And in order to get a button, the goal, they didn't have to, the goal was to shout loud as they possibly can, ask me about my pagan, as loud and proud as they could. And they would get a free button. But if they were a little shy, but still willing to talk about it, if they wore their button, all they had to say was, ask me about my pagan. And then they get to pick whatever button they wanted on my jacket. And they got to take a button home. I got to be known as like the Pagan Pride Day mascot is what the coordinator of the San Antonio Pagan Pride Day called me. She's like, she's like, you're like our mascot. (laughs) I still have that button that you gave me. Awesome. You said that the Pagan Pride Day was held at the mall at that time. So that meant that anybody who was shopping at the mall who was not a pagan and attending the event could see you and approach you. Did you have anybody approach you? I did. I did have a couple of people. Most of them were men. Uh, They came up and were like, I don't understand what's going on. What is this? You know, what is this? And they're like all nonchalant and trying to be all Joe Cool or something. I I don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, and I would always start with, well, let, let me tell you what the literal definition of paganism is. Um, I'm sure, and some of them were Hispanic men, and they under, they came from a, a cultural, and they understand the terms bruja and curandera. You know, and I said, well, most of us would, would kind of fall more into the curandera pile, because um, for them, a bruja would be really... I mean, the, the terms are still evolving because now we know Bruja is witch, but we're trying to merge many different cultures. And now, as a Hispanic, I can still say Bruja as a positive, but in more traditional, it, it, I would be more of a curandera. And so I would try to help them kind of like traverse that and explain it that way. And um, they'd be like, oh, okay. And then they kind of carry on. Um, but most of them were men that came up and actually were a little bit more bold and able to ask me questions. Because I am out there being loud and um, letting everybody know, you can ask me questions. I am approachable. It's okay. Very interesting conversations I've had with people. I did have some people not necessarily approach me, but a group of women did come and form a five-person circle right next to my booth where I would take a break or hand out brochures and literally for like about a minute chanted, Jesus, Jesus, 
Jesus and just right there by my booth, you know, and I'm just kind of standing there. I'm like, go Jesus, you know, <laughs> or what? I don't, I don't hear if that's what you really want to do. Um, would you like to talk? But they didn't really want to talk to me. Uh, there were a couple of uh, little older Hispanic women who would walk by our booths, you know, and do the, the sign of the cross as they're walking by, you know, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you know, and with the sign of the cross, they had to protect themselves. Do you think that's what it was? I think so. I think they were really scared. And I wish I could have talked to them. And But they, you know, I can't, I'm not going to chase after them and be like, hey, I'm not evil. You know, that, that would, I'd be scaring them more. Still, knowing that some of them do come up and at least with curiosity, asking questions, I'm I'm able to be okay with whatever that reaction may be. Even if we can't agree, hopefully we can at least separate amicably with agree to disagree. And let's just think about the fact that we're both different people, but it's okay. You know, Um, that would be like always my angle if there was any confrontation or issue. There's always going to be issue. And it's not even just a Christian pagan thing. Even in the pagan culture, there's like there was this big, huge thing. Like after Katrina, a lot of the Voodoo's and Hoodwans came from New Orleans to San Antonio. And we had such a huge Santeria uh, following in San Antonio. And I found out later there were lots of conflicts between those groups on whether they can or cannot teach their faith. Where the Santeros were really trying to, the Santeria and the people who practice Santeria were really trying to educate uh, San Antonio people and be a little bit more open about their spirituality so that they could be accepted. Um, I had heard that when the more people from New Orleans came in and brought voodoo, which there's a lot of cross hairs there with all of that spirituality, they were really mad that it wasn't being kept as a secret practice. And it caused, again, because I'm not, I wasn't in the thick of it. I, it's just because my mentor is a Centero. He told me some of these things that happened in certain herbal shops, botanicas. <laughs> uh, some, certain botanicas actually closed their doors again to be private because they just didn't want to deal with the controversy. It's, it's really sad that that happens. It does. It definitely does happen. It's not just a Christian pagan thing. It's I mean, heck, the Christians get mad at each other for the different denominations of Christianity. It's We're all human at the baseline, so we've just got to learn to live and let live, hopefully. That's, that's my goal, anyways. We're about out of time. You've already told us that we can find you on YouTube, Eclectic Traditions. Is there anything else you would like to tell the listeners as far as staying in their closet, coming out, living authentically? Because I know you're a very vivacious person and you are like so real to yourself. You're very true to yourself. I know not everybody can do that. No, you can't. I'm sure they've heard it many times, but it comes down to an individual thing of whether or not in the long run, it, your safety, your survival, your mental health, spiritual health, it's, it's all up to you. And if you feel following your intuition, if you don't feel it's right time to come out, then, then it's okay to hold on, hold out. But for those times when you really just want to be yourself, finding those circles, finding those connections that will help you to at least, if you can't completely come out of the broom closet or rainbow closet or any closet that you happen to be in, Find that person that will help you peek out at least every now and then so you can still be yourself. Even though I did face some discrimination from my own mother, my grandmother was more my mother. And I just, I was so lucky to have her in my life. And I know not everybody's lucky enough to have someone like that. Um, for others, especially newbies coming into, um, into paganism, I already have actually three spiritual daughters that in our pagan faith, they are my goddaughters. Many of them don't have uh, don't have the parental support that they should have had, but I am also one of those that tries to help those along the way. Um, UU churches have great resources. They do have CUPS chapters, which stand for Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans. It's usually a good, safe place to start if you can't find a connection. And if you're under the age of 18, hold out till you're 18. 
That's all I can say. Hold out till you're 18 and you can be able to do it when you're a legal adult and you're out of the house, or at the very least, you can find that connection and maybe someone will help transition you out of the house as an adult. Thank you for all that. That was a really good explanation. Thank you for coming on the show, Cole. Oh, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for Witch Casting with Theodora Pendragon. Have a burning question or have a topic you'd love Theodora and her guests to discuss on the show? Contact her through Instagram at Theodora Pendragon. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And help us spread the word by leaving us a rating and review and sharing it with your friends. See you next time and may your magic always shine.